Nacho! Sniff, sniff, sniff. Der, 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 der. Sneezes is that today? Oh, 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 sniff, sniff, sniff. Dear, 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 dear. How many sneezes is that today? Oh, my back still sore off that four in the kitchen. War hero injured bending for tea bag. Oh, take my pill. Oh, I don't know. Two metal knees. Touch of angina and aspirin to thin my blood. False teeth, hearing aid. Huh. Well, I pop off for that to hold the service in a scrapyard. <laughs> Laser treatment on my cataracts, that was a bugger. And then, then I discover this light is green, and I always thought it was blue. Huh. Always had trouble with that, though. I like your blue jumper, Peter. It's not blue, it's green. <laughs> God knows how the RAF ever let me up in a Spitfire. Huh. Henderson cannot always distinguish the grass from the sky, but we think his attitude will see him through. <laughs> now, what's the next item on the agenda? Ablutions or phone Betty? Got to check your lady friends are still alive. Bugger it. I'll have a ciggy, uh, ring Madame Gazonga, and then a blute. <laughs> ah! <laughs> sniff, sniff, sniff. Dear, 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 dear. Hoofty, poofty. Oh. Blue tits on the fat ball again. Oh. No problem with their cholesterol. expect you're on your way to the phone or in the bath or down the garden. Everything's A-OK -okay this end. Blue tits on the fat ball again. I'll speak to you shortly. Bye -zy bye. Didn't get to the phone in time. Try again in a jiffy. Never thought my last overtures to a woman would be doing her garden for a sticky bun or three. Still quite a handsome woman when I first offered to thin her seedlings. <laughs> right. Engaged. She's trying to ring me now, the silly sausage. Oh, little fart. Better go for a shit. Oh, ah, oh, oh, ah, oh. Oh, bugger. Oh, ah, oh, oh, ah, oh. Oh. Hello, good morning. And how are we this morning? Yes. Yes. Have you looked under the flower pot? The flower pot, yes, silly woman. You know I always put it under the flower pot. You were there when I did it. Oh, anyway, blue tits on the flat ball again. Rained in the night and I had to get up three times. What? No, 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 the, the, the two things weren't connected, dear, 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 dear. Don't worry about that. I'll, I'll bring some twine when I come over. You know I always come over on a Tuesday. 
We want to prune the wisteria, don't we? Oh, don't we? I thought, all right, all right, all right, yes. Usual time. Well, the other usual time then. Yes, yes. By the by. Ah, go for a shit. Oh, oh got a message. Peter. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Peter's coming to live here after all. I know you mentioned it, but I didn't think. Thought he'd have a family of his own by his age. Seems only yesterday he wrote that little poem for my birthday. Where is it now? I hope I'm like you when I'm 52, that I can look back and say, son, that life was fun. I'll do it again someday. <laughs> I hope I'm like you. <laughs> Certainly wouldn't have said that if I told him everything. <laughs> I remember that birthday. <laughs> I rang Julia, went and picked her up, brought her home, and ended up celebrating my 52nd, having fun and frolics on the sofa bed. <laughs> while Maggie was in hospital. Dear, 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 dear. Oh, thinking about Maggie now. Didn't seem to affect Peter much when he was little, her illness. Happy little boy. Always wanted to do things with me. Aeroplanes, war films, going to football matches, World Cup 66 and all that. Football mad. He could be a bit demanding, is that the word? Going to the fun fair wasn't enough. He'd want his own fun fair in the back garden. Dad, Dad, you got my helter skelter yet? I looked everywhere. I, I couldn't find one. Never seemed to settle. Left school early, different jobs. Got himself a degree and then went to work in the bloody biscuit factory. Then the bingo. Why couldn't he get a proper job in a suit? Found himself a nice girlfriend there. Well, I was expecting wedding bells, but, well... And then Maggie moved down to be close to him and didn't handle it very well when she died. He'd always liked to drink, just like she had, but after that, oh, dear, 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 dear. Still, two single gentlemen sharing digs. Oh, should be all right. Peter, Betty, under the flower pot, the blue one by the back door. What do you mean it's green? If it's by the back door, then it must be blue. Oh, silly woman. <laughs> Beggars can't be choosers, I suppose. I won't forget. I won't forget. Sticky bun. Yeah. Bye -zy bye. Oh. Picky about these sticky buns. Very particular. It's got to be a bun and it's got to be sticky. I don't know. I never had a game plan, but if I had, it wouldn't have featured being single and moving back in with dad when I was 48. It's not as if I moved back into the ancestral home. Dad bought the cottage after you left Mum when he took up with Julia. I bet she chose the place. Little Victorian, two up, two down, roses round the door. Mm, right up her street. Anyway, when I moved in, first thing Dad did, took me under the stairs, showed me the fuse box. When I moved in with Jo in Brighton, she took me upstairs, showed me her fuse box. <laughs> Bingo called. <laughs> she knew her mind, Joe. She was strong, punky, electric red hair. Not my type at all, really, but she fancied me, and that's a right old turn on, isn't it? And she drank pints and stood her around. <laughs> in those days, I kept my drinking in the pub, but Joe bought her pills by the thousand, and there was always a bottle of scotch floating about. Sex and drugs on draft. And I still had my exes. Amanda, oh, Amanda was gorgeous. That hot, steamy summer of 77. Couldn't keep our hands off each other. But she dumped me, broke my heart. 
So I met Rosie on the rebound. Another blonde, only 17, she played the flute. Now Amanda suggested getting back together, but changed her mind after I told Rosie I was still in love with Amanda. Broke Rosie's heart. She gave me a black eye with a raised paper bin. So by the time I met Joe, I was trying to get Rosie back, but still pining for Amanda. And then there was Liz. Oh, bollocks, what was I thinking? Yeah. Of course, Joe was having none of it. Rosie came down to Brighton. I was in a pub with Joe on the seafront. Rosie's in the bar next door, dressed to kill. And I was scuttling between the two. Oh. But I made the grown-up decision. I chose Joe's intellect and spirituality over Rosie's breasts. And the big bag of drugs under Joe's bed never even come into it. Game plans. <laughs> Scoring the winning goal for Spurs in the cup final, that was one. Had a great left foot, shit right foot. Singing a rock and roll band, that was the other. I, me, I could do Mick Jagger impressions in the bath when I was six. Yeah, yeah, born to rock. Yeah. Okay, I was tone deaf, but it was punk, wasn't it? So I was quitting. And I didn't call myself a singer, I called myself Sam Snide. Lead vocals in The Snides. Oh, we were edgy, vital, slicing through the pretentious bullshit of the new wave. And I got a fair few shags as well. They weren't game plans, they were just daydreams. Did I ever dream I'd be a bingo caller? Well, I don't know, but all those summer holidays, always Bogner. We went to the Isle of Wight once. Dad was convinced he could get duty freeze. But we missed Bogner. We missed Percy Pluck's guest house, the putting green, the knickerbocker glories, and going down the pier to play bingo. And I loved it. And when I moved to Brighton, I worked on the seafront. Novelty t-shirts, beach photographer, and then, da-da, Peter's bingo. Fancy a quick one, darling? Yeah, we can play bingo after. <laughs> Ah, clickety click. Sit down here, take the weight off your purse. Okay, you're looking for a straight line of fire going across the card, down the card, corner to corner diagonally, and don't forget the four corners because they count as well. There you are, and here we go with your first number out this time on the red line. All the ones, those legs 11. I loved it. Taking good money, chatting up the birds, customer friendly, very customer friendly, but I don't know, the long days, even longer nights, it got to me, having to be the cheeky chappy all the time. And the liveners took over. Started ducking my head down, swigging the vodka, middle of a game. Dozing off. Oh, I had more final warnings from Wally, the fairground owner. And one day, I was pissed. Someone complained. I think it was that bigger boned lady. I called her a two-seater. It's a technical term. Anyway, Wally, middle of the game, by the throat. Fuck! Right! Off! You're a liability! Called those bingo numbers out for years. Just telling myself I was waiting to be discovered. Game plans. So, moving back in with Dad has meant that I've had to get used to all his little ways, which, of course, are all wrong, compared with mine, which are all right and proper and perfectly acceptable. The toilet roll. Now, when I change the toilet roll, I have the paper hanging down the front. It's practical, it's attractive. When Dad does it, he has it hanging down the wall side. You have to fiddle about to get the end. <laughs> he has this thing with the radiator, reaches out, that's hot. Well, don't touch it then. Oh, it's his running commentary at breakfast. There really is no need to say sniff, sniff, sniff after you've sniffed. My dad, the war hero. And it's impossible not to count the sneezes. I've done it all my life. At least 12 sneezes every day. The record was 29. 29 sneezes at a single sitting. Oh, it's his pill-taking face and uh, 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 noises. His slurpy tea-drinking ah, noises. He's sitting down and uh, ah. Ah, standing up noises. What do they call it? What do they call it on radio? Dead air. He has this strong dislike of dead air. If he's not popping sucky sweets into his mouth, then a constant stream of inconsequential bollocks is pouring out of it. And he's like a big kid sometimes. I cooked him spag bowl last night. Oh, dun dun's yum yum. <laughs> and then he tastes it. Uh, 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 oniony, oniony. Ah, oh, and I sit and listen to him talking to Betty, and I like it that they phone each up every morning, congratulating each other on surviving another night. But it's all such little, little tiny stuff about the weather. Uh, how many times they got up in the night to pee? What happened on neighbours? Neighbours, Jesus, anything but neighbours. Ah, I know, I know. 
I know. I'm not being fair. When I was 21, I was struggling on the three-point turn. When Dad was 21, he was flying his Spitfire over enemy lines, shooting photos of people who were shooting bullets at him. Now, he's a very tidy man, and he keeps a very tidy address book, and he notes people's deaths with a very neat little forward slash. So it's Jane and Dinsdale, Jane and Bob. Uncle Bob died a few years ago. It's a very efficient system. I think I'll give old Bob a ring. Hang on, just better check. Make sure he's still alive. Ah, oh, yes, sir. But right underneath, Kate and Harry Dupree. So it's Kate and... Dupree. Well, did he die twice? Well, Dad denied everything until I showed him the grisly proof. And he said, oh, yes, well, I rang him up one day and he wasn't feeling very well. Wasn't feeling very well! And is this how my dad, the fearless grandfather of two DFC, spends his afternoons in that dull window between diagnosis, murder and flog it? <laughs> Hello, Derek, how are we? Well, uh, uh, really? Pneumonia? Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. But, uh, but, but you got the all clear yesterday? <clears throat> no, 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 just clearing my throat. <laughs> bye -zy bye <laughs> Death does seem to be on his mind, though. Last week he got out his big black box, his will, his insurance policies, the hymns for his cremation. Oh, I didn't want to be looking at that any more than I'd wanted the Facts of Life lecture. Oh, I was in the bath for that, but not with Mick Jagger, that was before. Well, you know, girls are funny things. Sometimes they let you and sometimes they don't. <laughs> and that's probably why I'm single and why he's going to live to be a hundred. Dear, 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 dear. Oh. 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 Sniff, 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 dear, 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 hoofty, hoofty. Now, what's the next item on the agenda? Ah, oh, yes. Hmm. Reminiscences for the Imperial War Museum. Now, let me see. In preparation for our interview next week, I thought it might be useful for you to run over your early life, a timeline of your RAF service, notable events, anecdotes, and so on. The dictaphone is fairly straightforward, so you shouldn't have too much difficulty. Use more buttons than that in my time. Mind you, I can't work the TV remote. Better watch what I say if it's for posterity. Bloody thing worse than my hearing aid. Instructions. Bloody hell! Oh. Oh. That's the microphone! <laughs> Strangers in the night! <laughs> Frank Sinatra! <laughs> Right. I was born in Marylebone in 1922. July the 22nd, 1922, that's when I was born. Uh, my mother moved down from Grimsby, but I never knew my real father. Oh, bugger. Don't want to let him know I was illegitimate. The old mum was a naughty girl back in 1922. I only found out when I got my birth certificate to join the RAF. Father unknown. Uh, what a way to start a war. <laughs> Rewind. Ah. Start again. Join the RAF straight from school. 
started training straight away, but the weather was so god awful, we hardly ever got off the ground. So they sent us to train in America, Miami. Oh, couldn't believe our luck. Turned out to be Miami, Oklahoma, where the wind whistles down the what's it, and that took the shine off. But still, US of A, marvelous. No rationing, no blackout. Flew solo for the first time. <laughs> Broke my duck with the ladies. Well, hey, oh bugger! <laughs> Rewind. <laughs> No rationing, no blackout, flew solo for the first time. Yeah. Joined a squadron in North Africa with Ginger Roberts. Ginger got killed at Salerno. Did you know the anagram of Salerno is arsehole? Oh, bugger! <laughs> is this what they want? Notable events and anecdotes. Oh. Come on then. Um, ah! Flew my first Spitfire. Oh, fell in love on the spot. Excellent aeroplane. Oh, the throaty roar of those Merlin engines. Unforgettable. Nat King Cole. <laughs> Started flying number two on ops. Pranged the kite a couple of times. First time, got hit by flak. Came down in no man's land. Ah, now this is a good bit. Had to hide in a barn from a German patrol. Cover myself in straw, clutching a revolver. Jerry on the prowl. I was petrified. They could have found me at any moment. They didn't. They just wandered off. But I thought, well, bugger this for a game of soldiers. And as soon as it was dark, I headed off in the other direction. Thought I'd better blend in. So I tried to disguise myself as a Bedouin. Tied my shorts around my head like a turban. Heard a jeep approaching, threw myself in the ditch. What's that accent? Powerful riff of garlic. Ah, aha, the French! Ah. They were confused by the turban, but ah, they filled me full of brandy and got me back to the squadron. Ah. Poor old mum. She got a telegram saying I was missing in action. Never thought I'd be pleased to see a Frenchman. Ah. What else? Oh, oh the, the food in North Africa was fa ah. The food in North Africa wasn't very nice, but Teddy, big ears marshal, taught us to fish with explosives. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Bob. Enough to feed the whole mess. Mind you, no one else remembers this, so maybe I dreamt the whole thing. Won't tell him that. Lose all credibility. Oh. Then, then Sicily, Italy, Monte Cassino, uh, we all got a bit hairy up there, but I don't know, the parties in the mess, the sun, the sea, the wine, the girls, we threw ourselves at the good bits to balance out the rest. I didn't want it to end, but it did. VE day, I was in Naples, and that's where I met Maggie. She and the other ATS girls threw a party, and when I knocked on the door, Maggie answered it, sign round her neck saying, have a drink on me. <laughs> Silly game from the mess. Popsy offers you a drink and gives you a piggyback, so you have the drink when you're on her. So, uh, took the glass of wine, gave her a smacker on the lips, jumped on her back, and off we went. <laughs> Half the squadron galloping around on girls' backs. <laughs> she was just the prettiest thing. The year was over, but the parties weren't. Italy, Austria, young and having fun. Especially for Maggie, from a little fishing village in Northumberland. We started doing everything together. And then, one night, we went swimming on our own, holding hands and paddling in the lake. Even with wet hair, she looked so... That's when I proposed. Soppy, I know. And we got married, just like that. Only known each other a few months, just seemed like the thing to do. War was over and I had to stop imagining every day it was going to be my last. Then back to City Street, I've been away for four years. Started the war as a schoolboy and ended up a married man. From squadron leader to insurance salesman in one fell swoop. Yes, Maggie and me. Two lovely daughters growing up. Idyllic, I suppose you'd say, but... Well, then Peter came along. And Maggie just couldn't cope with having another baby. I, I don't know. The, the shouting, the rows, hearing voices, imagining things. 
she wouldn't go to the doctor. I tried and tried, tried to talk to Maggie, but Maggie wasn't there. Dr. Cooper came round in the end, and he, she was shouting and screaming at him. And in the middle of it all, she hit the target. You've been seeing that Annie Williams behind my back. I suppose Annie and I did sell a bit close to the wind sometimes, but none of them meant anything. Not until Julia. I actually had to sign the papers committing her. I had to. She wasn't Maggie anymore. The girls upstairs in bed hearing everything. How to look after them when I was at work as a baby. And how to explain when I didn't really understand things myself. The doctors. Imagine your wife's head is full of wires and some of them have become short-circuited. We're going to give her a series of electric shocks through the brain. Try and sort things out. <laughs> Trick cyclists. We had them during the war. Didn't do any good then either. Oh, Maggie came home. The girls had made a banner. Welcome home, mummy. <laughs> she didn't ignore it. Just didn't seem to touch her. She was somewhere else. The pills, I suppose. She was quiet, stable, no more rows, but no, no spark. No, no fun. Just disappeared. I'd come home at night not knowing what to expect. Used to have a couple of braces in dirty dicks before catching the train home and hoping for the best. Between her relapses, things almost got back to normal. We'd socialize with other couples from the pub, theater trips, dinner parties, and so on. And Maggie threw herself into it. She seemed to be enjoying life, but I don't know. Did she get bored? She just drifted back off into her somewhere else. Did it, did it. Of course, Peter was too young then, but I made the decision not to tell him about Mum's illness. I, I, I thought the less he knew, the better. He said he never knew about Julia. They were all shocked to find out I'd been seeing her for three years. I remember I'd brought a set of golf clubs as an excuse to get away at weekends. And later on, Peter said, so, you met Julia on a golfing weekend. Is that right, I said, yes. Somehow I just couldn't bear to tell another lie. I never planned to leave, but Julia was a joy. Young, beautiful, and fancied me. Uncomplicated. Always starts out uncomplicated. But I fell head over heels for this one. Wouldn't have left otherwise. Waited till Peter was 18. Thought that was the thing to do. But looking back, never admit to anything. That was always the game. Oh, Maggie. She always said she missed the sea, but... And Peter never got over it. Used to get so angry, shouting the odds about Mum. Definitely not going to the Imperial War Museum. I was only little. It's right on the edge of my memory. Sunday lunch, and Dad had had enough. Oh, go back to your mother if that's what you want. And Mum left the room. I followed her and found her sitting on the edge of the bed, crying a little. Mummy hasn't got enough money to go away, Peter, darling. I was chuffed. Went back downstairs. I don't think Mum's got enough money to go away. You've been to see her, haven't you? I didn't want anyone to leave. I didn't want to upset anybody. I didn't understand then. I didn't understand for years. Mum and Dad shouting, scared Mum was going away, and my sisters sitting quietly on Dad's side of the table. Where else would they sit? They were just little girls. They wanted nice mums, not mad mum who put the TV in the flower bed. Dad was safe. 
on family holiday, dad and my sisters off swimming, me in the dunes with mum making a little happy home in the sand. A house, a garden, a chimney. She used to spoil me so much, give me special meals. Birthday card for my sister. You can get your own bacon and chipples, now you're eight. <laughs> no school dinners for me. I went home for bacon and chipples. <laughs> I was a good little boy at little school. But big school, ah, oh, well, big school, it all changes. I knew straight away it wasn't cool to be good. I wanted to be with the bad boys. They were cool. They were the ones the girls fancied. So I knocked around with Steve. Now, Steve was an original, a real rebel. Not like me with my good little boy soft centre. I just cruised along in his slipstream. Drew our hair long, followed the faces and David Bowie all around London. Got our hair short, pistols down the 100 Club. Oh, David Bowie. <laughs> Didn't need drugs at a David Bowie concert. Still took them though, thing to do. <laughs> Thought it was a great idea to drop some acid and go to the Wimpy Bar. <laughs> I should never have gone to the toilet. <gasps> There's a geezer in the mirror. <gasps> There's a geezer in the mirror. <gasps> I couldn't find the fucking door. Oh! And with all this going on, mum and dad's influence just evaporated. Dad was good for money and lifts, and Mum, I pretty much treated Mum like a slave. I'd never been told anything about her schizophrenia. I just thought she wasn't well sometimes. Dad called it her nerves. But I was learning, watching my sisters, how to deal with Mum. I knew they watched her for unusual behaviour, but sometimes unusual behaviour is not that unusual. That last Christmas we were all together, we were all pissed, ganging up on Dad. We're not watching the Queen's speech because she's a silly old cow. You can't say that about a member of the royal family. Well, let's ask Mum. Mum, what do you think? Well, I think the Queen's a little bit shitty, Peter Darling. Ah, ha, ha, ha. There you have it. The Queen is shitty, shitty old Queen. Ha. <laughs> My sisters both left home. One of them left home all the way to Canada. And suddenly I was 18, with Dad thinking I was grown up. Grown up enough to handle him leaving Mum for a girl who was two years younger than my sister, which brought on another relapse in Mum. She got stable, but it took longer. She was so angry, so bitter. And I was no use. I was no help at all. I made no kind of effort with Mum in the slightest. She'd become a nuisance. For the next two years, I was it. I was the one having pointless arguments with Mum for hours, apologising to the neighbours after she'd been screaming at them, listening to her ridiculous stories about the Duke of Edinburgh in the bushes and some poor woman called Annie Williams who come in for some terrible abuse. I had to go behind her back to the doctor to get her readmitted to hospital. Relief when she was, but then meeting her on the bus two days later when she discharged herself. Coming home at night not knowing what to expect. Glad to have the excuse of going away to university. And after university, moving to Brighton. Anything. Anything rather than going back to Mum. And in Brighton, I met Joe. Behind the bar in a nightclub just up from Sherry's. Stayed up whizzing all night and walked home along the beach as the sun came up. Stop here, you're what? <laughs> then one of those delirious shags that you only get when you're completely knackered and up and at them for a busy day on the bingo. Joe came to work with me on the pier. We were never apart. Didn't want to be. We developed this really deep relationship based on understanding and accepting each other's feelings, which was tricky for a shallow, immature, and basically dishonest person like me. But tell me what you're feeling right now. I'm not feeling anything right now. You really must be feeling something. I really mustn't. Be honest about your feelings. I am. I'm not feeling anything. Oh, we had some long nights. We were drinking, taking loads of drugs. It exaggerates things, it distorts things, but I had no recollection of Joe telling me she stopped taking the pill. None at all. So, Peter, I'm pregnant. What are you gonna do? I'm not ready to have a kid, not now. I know. We're skint, we can't afford it. I know. I do want to, one day. I know. Dad paid for the abortion. 
if I'd have known, if I could have heard Joe saying in the years to come, this year she'd be eight years old. She was always so sure she was going to have a girl. We moved on, but I moved on. And after two or three years, Mum decided she wanted to come and live close to me. Oh, God. And she found a flat just around the corner, and she seemed really happy. She loved being by the seaside. And Joe was great with her. We had Mum round for dinner, took her for days out. Mum didn't let Joe in, but Mum didn't let anyone in. After three, four months, I realised that Mum had stopped ta taking her medication, the looking over her shoulder, the muttering, the giggling. I told her I'd made an appointment at the doctor's. What's it to you if I'm not having my injections? Because I care for you, Mum. I love you. But you love Joe more, don't you? Dare the appointment, went up to Mum's, no answer, but a note on the door. Found your handbag on the seafront, took it to Hove Police Station, ran all the way, note on the door. Lost property office, closed for lunch, back at one o'clock. Oh, for fuck's sake, a panic now. Mum was never without a handbag. I thought it was stapled to her arm. One o'clock. Well, missing persons report then, sir. A brief description, please. Body washed up at Shoreham Harbour. Police car to Worthing Hospital, went in round the back, past the bins, through the kitchens. Why? Grey door, dear Stedman. No easy way of doing this, Peter. Grey waiting room. What? Where? Curtain opens behind the glass. Mum, lying there in a white silk shroud, holding a red rose. All the lines and wrinkles had gone from her face. Peaceful. Little cuts and indentations. The waves. The shingle. The tide coming in. Oh, Jesus fucking Christ! You love Joe more, don't you? That was the last thing she said to me. That night, she walked out of her door, down the street, past our flat where I might have been watching telly, past the pub where I might have been drinking lager, down to the beach and into the sea. And that's when the guilt started. The angry guilt and the angry drinking. You will share my guilt. My dad, my sisters, oh, you, I was there at the end. But it's all your fault. You're to blame, not me. Everything I drank had shit at the bottom. Throwing my back at people that loved me and I didn't love anymore. Love. What's love but a fucking tool? Love never lasts so shit-faced and 40-something, screaming at Dad. Your fault, your fault. You never fucking cared. Language, Peter, language. Language, language, fucking language. You did this, you never did that, Peter. Maggie's been dead for 15 years. And I was caught there, between Dad's reason and my rage, balanced on his cutthroat, a black and white and life and death and love and language. And tantrum, tantrum, language, language, me, 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 slammed or stormed out, raged away to Waterloo, and suddenly, suddenly, it, 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 it stopped. <laughs> Something stopped me. Got the next train home. Went upstairs and slept it off. Grow up.
Hufti Pufti. What? Sniff, sniff, sniff. Dear, 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 dear. Ah, cup of tea. I know I shouldn't after a heart attack. Bloody gasping for one, though. Yeah. Bugger! Oh, bloody pills! Six a day now! Oh. Pill for angina, pill for cholesterol, thin the blood, loosen the arteries. In the arteries, loosen the blood. Oh. God knows what all the other buggers do. I know one of them's giving me the screaming hab dabs. Every time I have a poo, it's like turning on a tap. Oh. Must tell Peter to get more Imodium. Five more to take, plus two for the shits. Oh. All these pills for the rest of my days. Oh. Bloody heart attack meant I missed the squadron reunion, goddammit. First one I've missed since 1948. Oh. Been organising it for months. Peter's been helping me with that, though. Running round to the bank, doing the typing. Helped me a bit in the speech. He's doing more and more for me these days. The gardening, the shopping, the cooking. <laughs> Exotic concoctions sometimes, of course, but he's got to know what I like. <laughs> Worked out very well in moving in, really. And he's really sorted himself out with his drinking. All the island now, done and dusted, very proud. <laughs> My birthday last year. <laughs> Peter says, come on, Dad, off we go. Ended up in Bogner, of all places. Bugger Bogner. George V. Had lunch in a pub, and then he said, right, Dad, now for your birthday surprise. Goodwood Aerodrome. He booked me a flight in a little two-seater. Pilot let me take off. And he swanned around up there for half an hour or so. He said, do you want to loop the loop? I said, no, thank you very much. <laughs> Shame Peter couldn't have come up with me, really. But I don't know. Back in the cockpit at 85 years old. <laughs> so many memories. Day after missing the reunion, lying in hospital, visiting time, expecting Peter or Betty. <laughs> Loan me, but who should turn up but half the bloody squadron? <laughs> All friends I've known in Italy. Eric, Allen, Black Ward, Pip. And then lo and behold, who's to pair but Plunger Davis? <laughs> Haven't seen him for years. I was Plunger's best man. <laughs> and we had some tea. <laughs> ah, the reunions. If only we really could go back. Would I have left? <laughs> Madness. After the war, we found out the Germans had mentioned our squadron in their battle documents. They said our Spitfire pilot showed an audacity bordering on madness. I'm very proud of the squadron. 
Well, I know Peter is too. I'm very proud of him. <laughs> We've done all right by each other. Hope so, anyway. Why bring up the difficult things? What they don't know, don't hurt them. <laughs> Audacity bordering on madness. These bloody pills are driving me mad. Don't feel particularly audacious these days, though. I said I'd stay here for a year afterwards, and it's almost to the day. He was always so proud of me getting clean and sober, but he never really understood. Never understood quite how far I'd fallen, or how many empty bottles there were under the bed. And I'd really only got back to square one. I had to sell the cottage. If only I wasn't skinned. I could have bought the place off my sisters and stayed. But I'll get my share, and how's that bad news? Because I'm going to spend it, that's why. And now there's no dad to run to, on my own. He was always so active. Let's face it, he was twice Julia's age, and he kept her satisfied for 13 years. 13 years, Dad, unlucky for some. <laughs> Wasn't unlucky though, was it? No, nah, it was the Andrams did for Dad. The Pinner players. The Pinner players present Pinter. Betrayal. Julia fell in love with the director. She left Dad the year before Joe left me. He never sat around being a lazy sod like I do. He was always washing the car, mowing the lawn, doing something, always doing something. But after his heart attack, he slowed right down. He changed. And the constant diarrhea didn't help. One morning, Peter, Peter, I've shit myself. Oh. He had such a horrible time of it. Embarrassing, dirty, smelly. Most days, he was too scared to come downstairs. He was sitting there one day, and he just looked, just looked so down, so miserable. I've never seen him like that. I just wanted to comfort him, make it better. He'd always made it better for me. And I gave him this really awkward kind of... He went on for months, lost his appetite, couldn't eat Christmas dinner. Finally got diagnosed as colitis. The doctor put him on steroids, and he seemed to get better. But then it all went pear-shaped. The steroids perforated his colon, and he wouldn't survive the operation. My sisters got here in time, and <laughs> we had this one amazing afternoon. Dad was off his skull on the morphine, and he started talking about his life from the beginning. And that's how it all began. <laughs> he wasn't making a lot of sense. He kept on and on about the Duke of Edinburgh in the bushes and, and Mum's imaginary friend Annie Williams. <laughs> he seemed quite fond of both of them. And he even denied he'd ever played golf. And we all knew he was at it every weekend for years. <laughs> and he wasn't just talking about it. He could see it. He kept pointing things out on the wall the end of his bed. He had this fantasy flat screen of all those images that flash before your eyes, a private home movie of his life. He kept tugging his ears. 
The picture's all right, but there's no bloody sound. <laughs> The nurses told me that people often die just before the dawn. They wait for you to leave the room. Well, Dad would have known where I was going, known I was going to have a fag. He told us he'd left a letter for us in his big black box, said it was really soppy. We've never been a highly demonstrative family, but I've always loved you very much. That was the soppiest dad got. He just didn't do emotion. He just got on with it. When mum died, I drank two bottles of scotch. He never got pissed. Cried my eyes out. And I always thought when dad went, I'd go on a massive bender. But I didn't. I'd just gone with it. Sold the cottage. And the, and the morning it sold, I was sitting there drinking, drinking a cup of coffee. Got this pain across my chest. Went away, didn't worry about it. Too much coffee. Drove down the station, pain came back, went away. On the train, reading the paper, pain came back, didn't go away. It can't be a heart attack, it doesn't hurt enough. Four stops down the line, it starts to dawn on me that maybe I am having a heart attack. I know, I'll go around my mate Karen's house, she'll know what to do. So I got off the train, I thought, I know, I'd better have a sickie, because I won't get away in hospital. So, I'm walking down the Goldwalk Road, having a fag, having a heart attack. Oh. Karen knew exactly what to do when I passed out on her sofa. And when I came round, I was, I was confused. Am I having a heart attack? Did I drive? Why did I, the train? Am I having a heart attack? The ambulance man, is he always like this? Am I having a heart attack? No, no, don't you worry about it, mate. I don't know what it is, but it's definitely not a heart attack. You, uh, you come with us. So I walked out the ambulance. They plugged me in, ECG. And I was. I was having a heart attack. I told them I was. Lie down. Uh, aspirin under tongue. Uh, uh. Uh, uh, emergency, blues and twos, hospitals, what the fuck? Next thing I know, I'm lying on a trolley being told not to worry. And there's this screen up on the wall and there's all these tendrils floating about on it. And I realise it's my heart. And they're using the screen as a sat-nav to guide them as they unblock my arteries. There's a wire going up my arm and round about and into my heart. And I sit up to get, back, to get a better look and bang my head on some vital piece of equipment. Lie down, don't panic. I wasn't panicking. I just wanted a better look. I wasn't sure I had a heart. Anyway, just like that, in a bit, the pain went away. I said, you've done it, haven't you? He said, yeah, yeah, one more to do. And that was that. <laughs> Gotta feel a bit grown up now, and I, eh? Having a heart attack, just like Dad. <laughs> As it happens, I'm more pissed off about it than anything else. Makes me even less of a catch than I was before. Follically challenged, miserable old git, notorious alcoholic with recent heart attack and rubbish motor. Six, eccentric millionaires, elven beauty preferred, own teeth and busty substances is a must. M-I-L-F-C-I-N-G-S-O-H, he's gonna need a sense of humor, right? <laughs> Doctor's orders. <laughs> I hope I'm like you when I'm 52. I was 52 last year, the year he died. So I can look back and say, son, that life was fun. All these pills for the rest of my days. Dear, 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 dear. Thank you.